Welcome to The Happy Doc. My name is Taylor Brana. In this podcast and related website, thehappydoc.com, the goals are to inspire, develop knowledge, and provide tools to enhance your creativity, joy, and success as a health professional. Our guests provide their stories, tips, mindset, and much more, which have allowed them to succeed in such a demanding field. Our next guest is Dr. Amy Faith Ho, an emergency medicine physician and nationally published writer and speaker. She's been featured and published on NPR, The Today Show, Chicago Tribune, The Hill, Kevin MD, and many other platforms. Furthermore, her speaking and media engagements include presentations with TEDx, American Medical Association, American Academy of Emergency Medicine, and much more. She's also the chair of the resident section of AAEM, or American Academy of Emergency Medicine's Wellness Committee, and many of her pieces focus on this topic of wellness. Get ready to listen to this high energy and comical conversation with emergency physician Amy Ho and learn how you can be a happy doctor. Enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Taylor, and this is another episode of The Happy Doc. We have an amazing guest with us today, Dr. Amy Ho. Uh, Dr. Amy, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name's Amy Ho. I'm a current uh, last-year resident at University of Chicago in emergency medicine, and I'm really uh, grateful to be on the show and chat with you, Taylor. Awesome. Well, yeah, it's, it's great to have you. So before we begin, you know, um, I was very impressed with some of the um, things you've been doing in terms of not just medicine, but the wellness space in general. Can you describe some of those things you've been doing? Absolutely. So I am the new chair of the wellness committee in AAEM, Resident Student Association, which is um, an emergency medicine national organization. And we've noticed that burnout in emergency medicine and just in medicine in general is way too high for our liking. So we're interested in much the same thing that you are in how do we get people to enter medicine and stay happy through it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, so we definitely have, you know, the same same message here um, and we'll definitely dig into some of that, that conversation. Um, Also, I noticed, so some other things, you're a TED Talk speaker, you were mentioned in Forbes Magazine, Chicago Tribune, Um, you've been on uh, Kevin MD, so you've been doing lots of stuff in terms of writing and kind of getting your name out there. Yeah, and my interest is medicine is this crazy complex industry, and we're on the inside of it, and being on the inside of healthcare is totally different, I think, from being a patient and what the perspective is. So, I mean, emergency medicine, it's kind of crazy, right? Like, you you uh, go from, like, running a code to looking at, you know, someone's toe to, you know, diagnosing a stroke to sending someone to the cath lab, and then, you know, then you see the depressed suicidal person. It's, like, constantly changing, and it's very hard to describe what that's like from in medicine. So I love to try to summarize that and express that in a way that other people can relate to so they know how doctors are feeling and what we're coming from. So when they come see us, they maybe have a better understanding of what the situation is. Right. So in, in essence, it's, it's kind of like you're trying to humanize the experience and, and bridge gaps and understanding from, you know, patient to doctor to even the administration. Yeah. I don't think medicine is the old white guy in the white coat with the stethoscope and the reflex hammer in his pocket anymore. I think medicine is like us, like it's young people with a lot of diversity, diverse interests, um, a more emphasis on like work-life balance that have their own lives and like to take those experiences and integrate them into how you give care for patients. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, it's, it, again, it's, it's great to have you. So um, just a question to start us off here. Why did you start medicine and why specifically emergency medicine? So it was a little bit of a story of happenstance. I was in high school, and I was a high school debater, so we paid really close attention to different policies um, at the national level. And healthcare was one of those uh, industries that I researched. And I researched uh, healthcare insurers, and I was like, 
what a total scheme. These people are making money off of everyone being sick and then not paying out. I'm like, this is horrible corporate greed. So I got really interested in how can we address this um, for the nation and for, like, the healthcare in America and uh, was planning on doing, like, law or policy. And then I realized I had a fundamental um, information gap in understanding what it's like to be inside healthcare. So I functionally went into medical school as a bit of a reconnaissance mission to learn <laughs> on the ground what it's like to be a doctor um, with full plans of being a consultant or something at the end. Uh, then I like went down to the emergency room and I remember my very first day in there, um, I was a consultant. So I was coming from the medicine floor, seeing a patient and I had these brand new spanking boots. Um, that I was really excited about. And I turned around and a trauma had just come in. They put in a chest tube and blood spattered all over my brand new boots. <laughs> and I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> so, so that's how I got into emergency medicine. And um, on a bigger scale, like I love the day-to-day -day work. Um, I think it works with our kind of ADD <laughs> culture of, you know, changing from one thing to the next thing and um, having patients constantly evolve. Um, and then on a policy standpoint, I felt like everyone that you uh, know are affected by healthcare policies, like the uninsured, the poor immigrants, they all come through the emergency room. So we're the ones that get to see them all, take care of them, and understand how big policies affect them in a very real way. Mm-hmm, wow. So yeah, it's uh, the combination, you know, you say like our ADD culture, seeing the policy, kind of being in there. I love that story, by the way. That was, that was, that was hilarious. Um, yeah, that, that was great. So um, speaking of stories, um, can, give us a, a taste of maybe like a memorable moment or a, a funny moment on emergency medicine for you. I mean, one of my all-time favorite moments in like looking back and thinking that is so ridiculous, it's just hysterical, is um, there was a psych patient who was schizophrenic, paranoid, clearly needed to be admitted, um, and she was complaining that there are lasers in her vagina. And I'm like, okay, there's clearly no lasers up there. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere near that. She's crazy. She's a little bit aggressive. I don't want to sedate her quite yet, um, but I don't think we need to go looking up there medically. And then um, a new attending comes in, and I tell him about this patient, and he's like, well, he's like, for thoroughness, you should probably look up there. And I'm like, oh, God. So I go in there, I start my pelvic exam, I'm in there with a speculum, and she suddenly looks me dead in the eye and slams my ears between her knees and, like, locks me. <laughs> oh my and and I, I was just, like, so stunned. And then she, like, kegled and pushed me out. <laughs> um, so it was, like, one of those things where I came out and I was, like, I don't know what to do with that because <laughs> I'm just so shocked. But then looking back, you're, like, <laughs> this is – this is the hysterical thing that we get to deal with after four years of college, four years of medical school, three years of residency. Uh, this is my day-to-day -day life. Um, but it's like, wow. it's still such a privilege to be able to like take care of patients in like intimate moments like that, or, you know, in their most vulnerable moments. And to be honest, I'm like, that's, it's, I think it's a pretty good story no matter what. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to say that's probably one of the more ridiculous stories I've heard in medicine in a long time. So uh, there's a, some award that should go to you for this conversation. I'm not exactly sure what it should be. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and for the record, there were no lasers up there. <laughs> no, no laser beams. Well, I, I'm, no glad. Laser. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> at least there were no lasers. But um, I'm sure your ears were probably pretty sore after that event. They were, uh, yeah. <laughs> they were <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, okay, well, that's great uh, to start us off there. Um, <laughs> so uh, l let's get a little bit of your take um, in terms of burnout and maybe some of the things you're hearing and, and possible solutions. So I think one of the biggest issues in burnout is, um, you know, kind of stories like the one I told you. It, that's a very hard story to understand when you're not in medicine. To someone who works a nine-to-five corporate job like that in a million years would never happen to them. So when it comes to burnout, I think we've figured out that medicine is very alienating because our life is so different from those in kind of the rest of corporate America. Um, mm. So establishing social networks, there's a lot of giant Facebook groups also, 
where uh, doctors can share their stories. Like for EM, there's one called EM Docs, where doctors do everything from interesting cases to kind of lifestyle issues, just frustrations, to, you know, rants. And I think it's a really um, unifying way for you to vent in a safe uh, environment. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also for burnout, there's a, a, a ability for us to try to explain to people going into medicine, so pre-meds and medical students primarily, of what it's like to actually be a doctor and talk about some of the hard things that we don't always want to talk about, like how to handle death, how to talk about end of life, what it's like to have your first death as a as like a brand spanking new physician, because these are moments that I think shape you personally and professionally and have great uh, impact long term for you on how you feel about medicine. So it's something you should be prepared for and uh, told about from your mentors and seniors. Sure. And, you know, what you just stated is actually a very common theme I'm hearing where, you know, obviously as a student, you're quite idealistic, right? You go through this process, you're excited, you're like, I'm going to save lives, I'm going to know everything about the human body, I'm going to have all the answers. Um, And then you, you know, I I think each year you become a a little bit less, maybe uh, a little less idealistic and, and kind of almost apathetic in a lot of ways. So how how does one, maybe how would you describe to a student that's really excited about going in, what, what are they heading into? I think you're heading into one of the best, um, most personally gratifying industries out there because you do have the potential to actually save lives and you do have the potential to actually make huge impacts. But I think you have to understand the sacrifices that will happen. Like, there's obvious time sacrifices, but there's um, emotional tolls that you should just be ready for and know that everyone goes through them and you're not the only one. Like, you're going to have patient complaints. You're going to have people who pass away. You're going to have people that um, you, you know, basically advise into do not resuscitate. And that's an incredible um, impact. And that is an incredible weight to take on, especially as, like, a 20-something-year-old. Because if you went straight through, you're about 26 when you come out, and you realize you are making life and death decisions for people who have three times the life experience on you. But you have to be really confident in your training and confident in, um, in your intention, I think, to feel comfortable about making those conversations and trying to help people make those decisions. Wow, great. And to to all the, you know, pre-medical students or even those listening in who know pre-medical students, definitely should tune into that portion of this conversation. Um yeah, that's that's a the great a great response there. Um in, in terms of, you know, the what we're trying to get out in 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 this podcast and everything, it, we we want to talk about happiness. So, what do you think it takes? First off, let's define how So, what do you think happiness is first off? And then how does one kind of achieve, you know, fulfillment or happiness and and joy in medicine? I think happiness is really being excited to come in. Um, Like, you want to be able to say, I have a shift and I actually want to go to it. It's not a huge burden for me to have to come in. Um, Because we... We'll, we'll kid ourselves if we think that every single day is going to be, you know, puppies and sunshine, because it never is. But you have to see the flip side of things that aren't puppies and sunshine. Like, you have to realize that there's kind of humor in getting your uh, ears lost between uh, schizophrenic ladies' knees. Um, <laughs> and I think it's having that attitude that is um, kind of ultimately the key to happiness in medicine. Um and I think you have to have an internal uh, gratitude also for just life in general because um, we see so many things that are life and death and things that aren't also. But you realize that life is fragile. Relationships are fragile. You see incredible people like 90-year-olds that have been married for 70 years and like die within a day of each other. That's like actually really beautiful even though it's tragic. Um, And I think we have to recognize the silver lining to those sort of situations because we're so privileged in being able to be a part of those in so many people's lives. Sure, sure. So for you, a big portion of it has a lot to do with mindset. Absolutely. I think if you come in with um, with a bad attitude, no matter what specialty or even what industry 
you're going to burn out and you're never really going to be happy. You have to see the good in what you are doing and kind of either accept the frustrations or get excited about how to change them. Mm-hmm. Wow, great. So, so what gets you amped up before you get into work? What are you thinking about? I mean, I love uh, resuscitation. I think the best part of emergency medicine is that we get to do really, really big things to people that make a huge impact. And we're not really, like, people that really tidy up things and, like, clean it all up. Like, we pass that on to the knitting team to do that usually. So what gets me amped up is I know that every single day I come in, I'm going to do something really cool, and it's going to um, make a – a big difference for someone, and that's what you're kind of doing when, even when you're going through other patients um, or even have, just having interactions that aren't so great, you know that you're going to hit that patient where you do something really great that makes up for all of it. Sure, sure. And, and you know, when I think about emergency medicine, I think about uh, EM as kind of like the action takers. Like you're just doing a lot of things, uh, and a lot of the thinking, you know, is going to go more towards, you know, Obviously, you're thinking. That's not. I'm not. That down, but, but I'm saying a lot of like the deeper medical thinking and diagnosing and differentials that's going on to the internal medicine group and and those other fields. So um, definitely for the action takers, uh, EM is and as you said, like ADD and having a lot of action all at once. Um, it's definitely the field to go into. I know, and we very much accept that we know what our uh, what our specialty is. And I think that helps a lot because we aren't really expecting to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and everything, make everything perfectly um, pretty. Like, we know that we are people that make big decisions with very little information, and I think we pride ourselves in doing that well. And I think we just kind of understand that the super, super detailed nuance sit around for a few hours and think about it situations aren't really in our practice. Um, and I think knowing what you are and knowing where you're good and where you're not so good and understanding where other people and other services and specialties are good and not so good is really key also to having good relationships with your consultants and your other specialties. Great, great. Yeah, so it's it's kind of just knowing what you know and then being able to say what you don't know and ask for help when necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's in general for life too, you know, like if you're if you're wonderful at – one thing, it, you don't have to be wonderful at everything else. You know you can ask for help on them. Awesome. And I, I think that's actually pretty common, and, you know, I can speak about that in students. Like, I think, you know, people go into medical school, they feel like they have to be doctors and extremely intelligent, and they put this burden on themselves of having to be the masters of everything. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you can speak about that from the, you know, higher level perspective, but, you know, if you put that burden on yourself, then you – it's it's a lot of stress, whereas if you just ask for help, it can make things a lot easier. Ask a specialist or an expert. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, like, emergency medicine was kind of this holy grail that I didn't really know was a thing. Because um, when I was, like, a one, a first year and a second year, like, oh, my God, biochem just crushed me every single time. Like, I, I still don't know the Krebs cycle and the TCH <laughs> cycle. <laughs> I, I, I think it was maybe a couple of years ago that I finally realized those are the same thing. Um, but but you feel so bad about yourself because your friends that are going into internal medicine or are like MD PhDs are so good at it and you don't understand why you don't get it. And now like years later, I realize I'm like, I can resuscitate a patient or intubate a patient better than they can. I'm like, I will still never know the Krebs cycle, but at the end of the day, it doesn't make a difference. Um, and I, I don't think med schools are great at telling you that because they want you, you still have to pass your boards and get through step and everything. Um, but realize that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and there's kind of a niche for everyone. And it's very dependent on what specialty you go into or even what residency program you go into as to how you feel you fit in that. Sure, sure. Awesome. Well, that, that's great, great, great stuff right there. Um, in, in terms of, you know, just even listening to you, you're a very high energy person. Um, what what is your daily routine like, and uh, what do you think contributes to your happiness and, su- and success? So for me, I've kind of realized that I am one of those people that needs to sleep a lot. Um, so when I was in medical school, that meant I didn't go to class very much because I could podcast it from home. Because waking up at 7, something about it just did not work for me. Um, and then in residency, I think I kind of realized how to get around some of the shift turnovers 
and how to deal with, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks. It's like you realize what you absolutely need to do to function. And for me, that's usually like food and eight hours of sleep. And then everything else goes on the back burner. Um, and we're very into triage in emergency medicine. Like the sick stuff comes back, the dying stuff comes back first, and then everything else can kind of like wait. And I mm-hmm. think life's like that also. Like there are things that are um, really urgent and high risk that you do need to address. There are things that are urgent but lower risk that you can kind of like put on the back burner, you know. And I think if you triage that appropriately, um, you'll get away with time management in a way that makes you happier. Oh my gosh. I just, yeah, I think what you just said was so well said. And it's almost like this conversation, that's it. Just like triage your life. We can just, (laughs) (laughs) we can just, I mean, there, like everyone just triage your life. (laughs) But it's so true. I met, so I, when I started residency, I met my fiance, my, my now fiance about a week before I started residency. And we went on a first date when things were just orientation and really easy. And then my first two weeks of residency were in the CCU where you're working 80 hours, like everyone's dying. You feel bad all the time. And you're just like, I don't know what to do. You're a first time doctor. Like you feel so much stress. And I remember of everything that was in my life at the time, I knew that job was, that my job and work was obviously incredibly important. So I couldn't drop that. But I also knew that, you know, I have a brand new relationship. So, I was like, that is something that is somewhat urgent, but very high risk. Because I'm like, dropping the ball this early is going to mean bad things later. Like, it's not going to work out. So, you know, kind of everything else took a back burner. Like, I had just moved. The house was a mess for you know, <laughs> several more several more months. Um, but you, you say what's important and what's, um, you know, at risk of uh, having long-term impacts if you don't address it now. Awesome. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I think that... Um, prioritizing in that way. I don't think people generally always think that way. That's that's a great way to look at it. And figuring out what is the absolute necessity for yourself to be successful or happy. Yeah, and, like, yeah. and also it's like, what's the worst that could happen? Because I mean, there's so many deadlines. It's like, if I miss a deadline for submitting this paper, what's the worst that happens? Like, well, I don't get published. But I'm like, that's not really a negative. That's kind of a neutral. That just means we maintain the status quo where I'm still not published. So it's like, just submit next year. If it ruins your life now, submit it next year. Sure, sure, awesome. That's a that's a great great tip. Um, any do you have any other tips that you'd say that helps you personally be successful or continue what you're doing? Yeah, I think multitasking is also really important. So, like I talk to my parents while I'm doing laundry. Like I like fitness and working out's always been really important to me. So when I had you know, board exams and, like, step and stuff to study for, I would print out all of the questions, like, from the question bank with the answers, and then I would, like, go and do kind of mindless cardio while while trying to study and just read all the questions. So I think mm-hmm. at a certain point, there's just not enough time, um, and you have to figure out a way to kind of squish it all together and stack it on top of each other in a way that works. Sure. So you're, you're, you were saying, like, like, task pairing, like, mindless tasks, like with something important where like for example like driving listen to a podcast or yeah yeah gotcha. yeah i'm all and i'm all about like having things come to you like i love twitter for like learning um learning kind of new things in medicine like there's a trend that's basically like hashtag like foam ed it's like f-o-a-m-e-d um, and it's kind of for resident level or maybe senior medical student level more than early medical student level, but it's basically free open access medicine education. Um, and it's like all these specialists who are highly published tweeting out 160 character pearls with a link to a cool journal or something. And I think that asynchronous learning is great for our lifestyles. Because again, we're ADD, we have small pockets of time, maybe you're waiting for the train and that's a great time to scroll through Twitter and be like, oh, that's cool. Um, mm-hmm. and then look at it later. Like there's things that need more time and you have to save those for your days off. So there's things that are, can just like come to you, like make life easy. Awesome. Awesome. And, and so you offered the, the Twitter account as a resource. Um, what other resources do you utilize? Do you think that is really helpful in your daily routine? Um, for medicine, I think up to date is great. I love, um, a lot of the blogs for like, the cutting edge on medicine. I love podcasts 
for medicine. Um, and a lot of, a lot of, for me, these are like emergency medicine specific, but there are other ones for like studying for step one or having videos for step one that you can just run on your phone. Um, and then just for normal life, I think, I mean, we're, we're totally an app sort of culture now, and I think you should help utilize those. So, I mean, if I need a buzz somewhere, it's like, I think you should Uber. I, um, you know, like Instacart a lot of my groceries because living in Chicago with like bad traffic, it could take an hour um, just to like wow. go pick up milk. And I'm like, it's yeah. probably worth it to, uh, to pay someone else to do it. And like same thing, like Amazon Prime is awesome. You don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to go out to the store anymore. So I think mm-hmm. it's things that you don't enjoy that take time that you can outsource to someone else. And um, when people ask you, it's like, how much money is that? It's like, well, there's an opportunity cost to it. It's like, in that hour, what could you do that's more efficacious? Yeah, absolutely. And especially in medicine, I mean, you you know, time is of the essence. So figuring out areas to, you know, limit that. And as you said, like outsource, that's that's a great, great tip for sure. Um, with, with that being said, uh, a question that I ask, you know, if you could create an ideal medical school or an ideal residency um, or even ideal medical system, what would that look like for you? I think for medical training, it would be a system that is um, interested in what the person is interested in. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you're in like an ER residency, um, you know there's things you have to learn, and that's easy, and that's going to happen anywhere. But you ultimately want to be somewhere that is interested in the fact that you, I don't know, love surfing and can figure out how to implement that into your training um, or just help you figure out how to work that into your work-life balance. Because um, treating people homogeneously, like medical schools, I think, often do, isn't super helpful. Um, and, you know, leads to things where you feel bad because you still don't understand biochemistry. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I, I, it's, it's a trend that I think is actually happy, happening in medicine, though, because uh, a lot of the medical schools are moving away from having an actual grade-based system and are going to pass fail and are going to trying to give people more or less this time and push them towards doing more research projects. Um, and I think that's incredibly helpful in moving healthcare forward and also incredibly helpful for your overall wellness and making people happy in healthcare. Awesome. So more customizability would maybe be the kind of summary point there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Es- essentially. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a great point to have. Um, great. And, um, would you uh, make comments in, in terms of you were saying training in medical schools? How about residency or or maybe even uh, on a systemic scale? I think on a systemic scale, the first step to making a better system of healthcare is getting everyone on the same page. Because ultimately, healthcare is a problem because the incentives aren't aligned. Like the administrators. The administrators want to cut costs and cut time. The doctors want more time and, you know, more flexibility and resources. The patients want quick answers. The insurance companies want lower costs and to pay out less. So ultimately, there is a common ground, but it's hard to get all the stakeholders together and have them talk about what that common ground is. Mm -hmm. Um, Which ultimately, I think, is where things like social media or things like your project are really important um, in having everyone understand each other Um, because that's fundamentally I think the problem is no one understands where the other is coming from and Mm -hmm. it's very eye-opening when you do kind of sit on their turf a little bit and you see why the administrators are pressured the way they are or you work for like a health delivery um, like a Medicaid health delivery uh, firm and you figure out like oh this is where your money and dollars have to go so let's all try to figure out a way that we can achieve your goals while also uh, not hurting others. Right, right. So, so really, uh, what you, the main message is this almost lack of communication and and understanding um, and bringing everyone to the same table. Yeah, because everyone wants the same thing. We all want good health care for lower cost. Um, yeah. But there's so much nuance and so many loopholes in that that it's hard to understand without actually either being in their shoes, which is probably impossible just because of time constraints or um, being willing and open to listen to them. Um, like, I mean, there's all these policies that they pass down 
from on high and you realize how doctors get around the loophole for that. You know, like there's, there's, we have things where there's like, well, time to provider, which means the time that a patient um, waits before they see a provider is something that we get measured on. And so systems just get around that. They just put a PA in the front and have them start things, quote unquote. But then if you start things, it still doesn't get to the end any faster because the middle part still doesn't happen any faster. So you realize yeah. the loopholes in it that need to be addressed and um, talked about in a nice communal way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. No, that's, that's a, a great point. So in terms of wellness, um, there's a lot of students and doctors who are having, you know, tough time through their process. What what would be your message to, to those who are having a difficult time right now? I think that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. No matter what, there is, you are still going to finish. And that's one of the beauties of, I think, our uh, career path is that we have discrete areas of training from college to medical school to residency where the whole system is garnered towards trying to get you to pass and get through it. Like medical schools aren't trying to fail you. They want you to complete. Maybe it takes five years instead of four years, but they want you to complete. And same thing, like residents do not want to fire. Residencies do not want to fire you. They absolutely want to have you complete. And maybe that means a little bit of remediation if you're having a hot hard time. Maybe that means you need to take some time off, but it all does end <laughs> <laughs> awesome well that's that's a great message and so for anyone that feels stuck know that it it does finish at some point <laughs> uh, no seriously no that's that's uh i think that is helpful for people because i think a lot of times they think there's no way out you know there's no ending point sure. so that's that's a great great message for sure or there's so uh, many like there's so many places where you can get to the same place. I mean, I get asked this all the time. Like medical students will say, like I, you know, I bombed step one, but I want to be a plastic surgeon. Uh, what do I do now? And it's like, well, you bombed step one, so you know that it's going to be harder to get into that residency. You should absolutely still apply, but you know, consider taking a transition year, consider doing research, consider going through general surgery, and then go into a plastic surgery fellowship. Like, there's other options to get you there. It's just the path might not be exactly what you thought it was. Right, right. Instead of it being linear, you kind of think, you know, in, in different ways. Okay, awesome. Um, that's that's a great point. Well, with that being said, Amy, I sincerely appreciate having you. Do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, I think my main thought is that medicine is a really fun place to be. And it's a unique place that you'll not find in any other industry. So if you're interested in medicine, if you're in medicine, um, know that what you're doing is a great thing. And even committing to medicine and choosing it is incredibly noble and, um, you know, something you should be applauded for in the first place. Awesome. Well, it was an absolute pleasure to have you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Taylor. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening into this episode. It was a blast to record. If you have any comments or feedback, send me a message to any of my channels. The Facebook page is www.facebook.com slash the happy doc. The Twitter account is the happy doc one. The Instagram account is the happy doc one. You can send me an email to the happy doc one at gmail.com. And now I have something to ask of you. If you are with my mission of elevating the space of medical care and the medical community, if you are with my mission of elevating the positivity that is within the space, then please comment, like, and share this material. Have a great week, guys, and tune in to a new episode every Sunday.